Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for APQC's November KM webinar on Untapping KM's Business Potential. And I'm really excited to talk about this today because I, I think over the last few years, we've seen a, a really exciting reorientation of KM from being thought of more of as a back office function to really taking a strategic role inside organizations and really partnering with the business as an internal consultancy, um, you know, helping different functional groups with their knowledge related challenges and opportunities. And I get so many questions from knowledge management leaders and knowledge management teams about what they can do to better partner with the business and, and support their stakeholders and objectives in those different functional groups. <clears throat> so a, a few months ago, we did a survey on applying knowledge management in the business and took uh, you know, a look at the level of support that KM provides to those different groups uh, you know, where people see additional opportunities to add value. Um, and, and today I'm going to share some highlights and some recommendations based on that research, uh, you know, to, to hopefully give you some ideas for how you can scale KM and, and apply it in different groups. So for those of you who don't know me, I am Lauren Trees. I lead the Knowledge Management Research Program here at APQC. So I'm in charge of the research that you're gonna see and the content that we'll have at the end of the webinar. Um, on the line, I have our research manager, Brittany Dixon, and she is gonna be in the background just helping make sure that um, any questions get answered throughout the webinar and hopefully throwing a few of those to me if you have have questions. Um, so thanks for being here, Brittany. Happy to be here. And I am flying solo on this webinar today, so I can obviously talk to y'all for an hour if I need to, but I would love it if you talk back to me, you know, share questions, share thoughts or, or your experiences in the chat, and, and I'll try to keep up with that as much as I can while I'm talking, and Brittany will help me do that as well. So this is our agenda for today's call. It's really a webinar in, in three parts. In the first one, we're going to look at the current state of knowledge management in the business. So where has KM done a good job of infiltrating the business and getting adoption? Um, what are the most common tools and approaches that, it, that it's using to support the business? Um, and, and where and why we see demand within the business growing. And we looked at that primarily in the 2020s, in the last three years. And then in that second part, we're gonna dig into this idea of business areas or functional groups where there's more potential for knowledge management to add value if it can provide more support and get more resources. So we're gonna look at areas where KM teams just are not providing a lot of support to the business and, and see if there are any obvious opportunities there. Um, we're gonna look at where KM leaders themselves see the biggest potential to add value. And then a little bit about the approaches used and, and the barriers to getting that kind of additional support and, and um, adoption. And then in the last section, we're gonna look at success drivers. Um, you know, for organizations that are effectively partnering with the business and effectively optimizing the flow of knowledge across the business, what are they doing differently and are there any obstacles we need to watch out for or, or best practices that we can apply to help improve that flow of knowledge across the end-to-end -end business processes? So for this first section, we're going to really look at the, the current state of KM in the business, you know, and what we see. So I'm going to start with some good news. Where in the business is knowledge management providing the most support right now? Um, and I was surprised to see that the number one area for high levels of support was learning and development. And we've seen a lot of convergence between knowledge management and learning and development over the last decade. 
I think as learning has maybe veered a little bit away from formal day-long training courses and embraced more on-the-job learning, social learning, bite-sized learning that kind of gets a little closer to the knowledge management sandbox. Um, and I suspect this uh, sort of high level of support is really representative of that close partnership. So I'm happy to see knowledge management and learning working closely together to identify knowledge needs, uh, create learning resources and opportunities for people, whether that's a training course or maybe participating in a community of practice or being on a webinar and make sure knowledge gets into people's hands in a way that helps them build their skills and competencies because that's obviously a key goal of both of those groups. So next on the list we have customer service and this one makes total sense to me. Uh, we, we've seen massive investments in knowledge bases to help agents answer customer questions. Um, you know, and, and customer service is one of those areas where sometimes it's a little bit easier to show ROI from knowledge management because you can show a direct impact on how long it takes to answer customer questions, first contact resolution, efficiency, and, and correct, uh, correct answers given by, by customer agents. Um, and at the same time, we, we've seen a push, I think, to consolidate uh, the, the knowledge base that we have for employees to answer customer questions and do work and that we have publicly facing on the website and things like that so that people can do more self-service and, and answer their own questions if that's what they choose to do, which is obviously efficient for everybody, um, where obviously it's not the exact same information, but there is a subset of that larger knowledge base inside the organization that gets pushed out externally to customers. Um, you know, it, it's, it's more efficient that way and it also helps with consistency. So if people are on the website looking at something or in an online community looking at something, they're getting the same answer that they would get if they called the, the organization or emailed the organization. So next we have process management and improvement. And this is a soapbox that APQC has been on for a while, so I'm happy to see so many KM teams providing a high level of support to their process teams. Um, you know, process management creates and manages so much documentation related to processes, whether that's standard operating procedures, RACI charts, process maps. Um, you know, but if people can't find and access that stuff within a few clicks when they're when they're doing their work, when they're in the process, it's very unlikely to get used. Um, you know, for process oriented organizations, it also spends so much time, um, you know, doing all of this process work. It, it really makes sense to align the knowledge that you have that's associated with that process, whether it's how-to guides or learning modules, um, you know, or the process documentation itself with those process steps so that if you're a person who's doing a particular process, a particular task, you can go to one place and, and find all the things that might help you learn how to do it, learn how to do it better, um, you know, improve the process itself, make sure you're adhering to the process, uh, and having that consolidated is a really great benefit of having that, that knowledge and process view integrated within the organization. Operations, I think that makes a lot of sense. That's the heart of the business. We need to be helping operations teams document and distribute critical knowledge. And then finally, project management. And that's another opportunity for KM to connect directly with internal customers. Um, you know, make sure that at the beginning of a project, a project team has all of the best practices and lessons learned and, and resources that are going to help them cut down the cycle time, cut down the budget, be successful. And then also to engage with those project teams at key milestones to make sure that, that the critical knowledge that comes out of the project gets documented and made available to future teams that are doing similar work. So the reasons why certain areas get more support also look really positive to me. This is what our respondent said. Um, you know, two thirds of KM leaders are picking areas that align with the organization's business strategy and goals. 
Um, you know, and then around half are kind of going where they're asked to. So if a business group requests KM or is interested, then that helps define the prioritization. And then around a third are supporting IT and, and digital initiatives within those areas. I do think that there's some opportunities to make a few more data driven decisions here, um, you know, around things like participation routes and, and grassroots demand and workforce demographics. Um, you know, for example, if there's a lot of retirement eligible folks or you have a lot of new hires in a particular business area, that might be an opportunity. And also, if you have a lot of ad hoc knowledge sharing and activities going on, that might be a great opportunity if you can detect that within the data that you have, um, you know, to go to that business group and say, hey, we can help you get more value out of what you're doing, um, you know, make it more efficient and more effective. And it doesn't necessarily have to drive the strategy, but um, you know, it, it's really critical to have that dedicated time and agreement for staff to participate in KM. Um, and I just want to point that out because it's at the bottom of the list here. Um, we talked to so many KM teams that are trying to execute strategies on their own without any dedicated hours from the people who own the knowledge, who understand the knowledge, who can validate and, and manage the knowledge. And it just typically doesn't turn out too well. So I just want to point that out to folks that if you don't have the dedicated time from the business, um, even if it aligns with the strategy and things like that, it's probably going to be a, a really uphill battle for you. So in addition to asking about the supported business areas, we, we also asked about KM activities. So what are you as a KM team doing to support those business areas that you're looking at? And um, there, there's always a lot of variety, but we continue to see those kind of classic KM approaches coming out on top. Uh, what I've put on the slide are the seven KM tools and approaches that more than 50% of the respondents said they were using to help support the business. So number one, content management, 71% are using that. Um, and also 52% also supporting search and discovery, probably in relation to that content management process. And, and this is where we've seen a lot of growth with, uh, you know, since the pandemic. Business groups just have more content that they can handle. And I, I think some have reached a, a tipping point where they're really asking for support on how to curate and, and, and make that knowledge accessible. 70% um, support some form of knowledge sharing meetings, webinars, and events, 55% communities and networks. Um, so there's obviously that continuing emphasis on connecting people and helping them share knowledge. Uh, you know, 58% on cat, or, or excuse me, 51% <laughs> on, on transfer uh, of best practices and 50% on after action reviews. Um, you know, and, and, and that's great in terms of that process and project knowledge that I was talking about earlier. Um, and then 58% on the capture and transfer of, of expert knowledge. And that's great because it really tends to be focused on what are the things that are most critical to the business. So there's, I think, a really good variety here in terms of tacit and explicit knowledge. So we're, we're managing those knowledge assets that are out in digital repositories, but we're not ignoring what's in people's heads. Also a good balance between individual knowledge, uh, you know, expertise and the sort of process and project knowledge that tends to come out in those knowledge, uh, you know, best practice transfer and, and lessons learned transfer processes. Um, and, and just in general, a pretty good portfolio where we see a lot of KM programs have three or four or five or six approaches that they're bringing, not one or two. So that's a really good sign of, of a healthy relationship because if, if you, you know, if you only have a, a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So you want to have a, a set of tools that you can bring to the business to help solve different kinds of, of knowledge related problems. So I wanted to, at this point, stop and do a little poll with you all, because um, the next section here is really focused on where we see demand growing within the business. So I wanted to just take your doll's temperature and see if you do see that demand growing, um, you know, and if you do, if it's kind of across the board, all different areas of the business, 
um, you know, or whether you're seeing it really take off in some areas of the business, but not at all in others, whether you've just seen a little bit of, of incremental growth in interest and demand in, for knowledge management, or whether it's just been flat or gone down, you just haven't seen any growth at all. Um, you know, because I've, I've heard a lot of different stories, different experiences over the last few years. Um, some organizations that have really gotten the idea about KM, really seen the value and where it's really accelerated in terms of demand. Others where they just had bigger fish to fry, like really big enterprise-wide problems around things like supply chain disruptions and things like that, where even though people knew it was important, it, it was really hard to get people to focus on it and, and devote any time and attention to it in the near term. Um, so, so I'm interested to see how you all uh, play out. So I guess we'll give you all a, a few more seconds to vote um, and then we'll hopefully look at the results. Okay, great. So most of you significantly across the board or in some areas. So 51% of you are seeing that kind of um, uneven distribution maybe. Um, and, and so I'm interested to see where you're seeing that. Um, Zoltan said the demand is growing and related to the learning organization activities. So training, onboarding, e-learning. Uh, Valerie says she's seeing growth in process management. So um, it, it's interesting to hear everybody has a little bit of a different story around this. And uh, I love to kind of find out what people are experiencing. So I guess next I will tell you all what we saw on the survey from that perspective. And then if you all have different, uh, yeah, um, Zubika says customer service and sales, internal tech support. Um, Eric says growth in organizations and acquisitions. So all over the board. And I think that's really indicative of what we see um, in the research and other conversations that we're having. So here's where our survey respondents said they were most likely to see significant demand growth. Um, learning and development, I think a couple of you mentioned that already operations uh, and process management. Those were the, the top three. Um, and, and I think that that reflects a lot of the trends we've already talked about. I'm interested in what's going on in IT and digital here. Um, I, I think there's a lot of potential needs and, and opportunities for partnership there. I mean, first, just you know, KM support for the IT function itself. As every company becomes a technology company, they tend to have more um, you know, in-house staff and contractors and vendors that they're working on in this space. Um, so there's just a lot more tacit and explicit knowledge to get a handle on. And I think in the, the shift to agile development, which has been really great in many ways, um, there are some agile teams that have fallen down a little bit on documentation and, and it may be time for the pendulum to swing back there. And, you know, but on top of that, with so many organizations pursuing digital workplace strategies, there's a huge play for KM to come in and, and help with the change management and the, the sort of knowledge strategy on top of, of all those content and collaboration tools. And that's an area where we just see screaming need within organizations to develop some policies and guidelines and, and how to's around that. Um, and, and then you also have a need to document knowledge to support automation. So I think there's a lot of different plays in that IT and, and digital space. <clears throat> I'm also curious about this growing demand within HR. I see a lot of HR teams trying to be more strategic and, and add more value, just the way we see KM doing. Um, you know, so there's a focus on trying to get the basics documented so employees can self-serve on these basic FAQ kind of questions that they call over and over again to ask. Um, you know, and that that'll hopefully free up some time for HR to spend on some more strategic activities versus kind of explaining the benefits plan over and over again and telling people where they're, you know, where to access their 401k, things like that. But, but big picture, I see a couple of themes here in terms of where we see demand growing. Um, a lot of enterprise support functions turning to KM for help. Um, you know, groups that are overall focused on innovation and improvement, and we're going to talk about that more as we go along. 
And groups that are focused on delivering knowledge to employees and customers. I think there's a real focus on user experience, both internally, employee experience, and externally for, for the customer experience. Um, and, and knowledge management has a, a real play to make there. Ooh. This is jumping ahead on me, sorry. I got it back. So I wanted to talk just in the last part of this section around where we see growing demand in certain business areas and why. Um, you know, and, and across the board, uh, the number one answer that people gave us here is that they want to, um, you know, break down business silos between teams and projects. And I think remote and hybrid work are obviously part of that growing need. When people aren't together physically in the same place, we have to be more proactive about how we communicate and collaborate with one another. And, and I also see this push for agility and responding faster to changes. Um, it really makes it imperative for people to have broad access to the organization's collective knowledge, not just the knowledge of their group or their team. And, on top of that, a lot of business groups just have more stuff to manage. Again, digitization and hybrid work play into that. But I also think it's just the tipping point of some of these electronic repositories. You know, we, we keep uh, you know, amassing things in a giant pile. Eventually, you get buried and you have to do something about it. Um, you know, and, and a lot of IT initiatives are trying to get these teams unburied. So I think it's reasonable to see KM pulled in as some of these systems, uh, systems migrations and digital projects to help make sure that the knowledge aspect of that gets handled appropriately. And then finally, obviously in a lot of industries, we've had a lot of turnover. In some, we've also had a lot of growth. Um, you know, and so there are a lot of new hires to onboard. And new hires are a great audience for KM because they have a lot of knowledge needs and they're not yet ingrained in the status quo. You know, when you've been in a company for many years, you may know who you should call to get a particular question answered or what weird archaic folder structure you can find information in. But new hires don't have that context. Um, you know, they really want something that's better organized, better documented, and, and more intuitive to navigate. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there as well. So now that we've looked at trends from the, the near past the last three years, I, I wanna shift a little bit and talk about the near future. In particular, where do KM professionals see opportunities for KM to expand its reach within the organization and, and where they think additional KM support is most likely to add meaningful value to the business. So first, I thought it would be interesting to take a quick look at the flip side of that first slide that I showed. What are the areas of the business where KM currently provides the least amount of support? So either no support at all or a very low level of support. And I bring this up here because I think there might be a few hidden opportunities in here. Um, I sit next to, in the office, Marisa Brown, who leads our supply chain management research. And as most of you probably know, supply chains have been on a, a wild ride the last few years in terms of, you know, pandemic related disruptions, um, you know, and the need to identify new suppliers, um, you know, to, to have more, um, you know, less sort of fragile supply chains, um, you know, as well as trying to keep up with some longer term trends around sustainability and, and digital transformation. And one thing that comes up pretty consistently in our supply chain research is they want closer collaboration um, you know, with their vendors, their suppliers, their partners, their you know, business to business customers. So I think there's a real opportunity there for KM to engage with some of these supply chain folks and figure out what they need, which may be a little bit different than what other, other enterprise groups do. I think facilities management's also an interesting one because some of these teams have been given pretty aggressive sustainability goals in terms of supporting the organization becoming more carbon neutral. 
Um, so, so I see that as a stable backend function that's being disrupted a little bit, and, and there may be some opportunities in some organizations, at least, for KM to help with that. And then also sales. I mean, there's definitely opportunities to reuse knowledge assets there and also to share best practices and lessons learned and have people who are more experienced do some coaching and mentoring. Um, you know, and the great thing about helping sales is if you do that and, and you can measure the impact, then that can really help clarify the return on investment for KM. So, so in short, I see some maybe hidden potential in some of these low support areas. But admittedly, the, these are not the areas that, that um, you know, that, that, that the survey audience see as having the, the most potential for, for KM to add value. They're kind of not focused on those no support, low support areas. Um, you know, they see some opportunities in areas that are already receiving maybe moderate support or, you know, even high support. Um, you know, but they think that that support can be further expanded and enhanced in some way. So, um, you know, you see we don't have massive consensus here. Every organization's different. The opportunities are going to be different as well. Um, but, but the top two areas where folks see that untapped potential to add value are process management and innovation. So I think that tighter integration with process teams makes sense for all the reasons that I cited earlier. Um, you know, I also think that KM and process can have a really powerful partnership as organizations move towards automating more processes. It's really hard to automate a process if you don't have the process steps documented and also all of the knowledge inputs and outputs to that process really clearly articulated um, in a consistent way. So, so I wonder if that's a little bit of the untapped potential that people see here. And then I completely agree about the untapped potential for KM to support innovation. Um, that partnership can work in a multitude of directions. Obviously, innovation teams have a lot of intellectual property that they want to protect and retain. Um, you know, you also want people to innovate on the foundation of the organization's collective knowledge versus just going off and, and doing their own thing and maybe running experiments or trying things that have already tried and failed and not leveraging those lessons learned. And in addition, KM can help with collaborative ideation, whether that's through, you know, a dedicated ideation tool that you're using to gather and refine ideas, or just throwing some of those needs out to communities of practice and, and networks that already exist within the organization, um, you know, and, and using those to come up with new ideas, brainstorm, get people to provide feedback on others' ideas, um, you know, and, and make them better. And then beyond those two, you have kind of a four-way tie between operations, learning and development, HR, and the C-suite corporate strategy. And I see opportunities in all of those areas. Uh, C-suite and corporate strategy is one that we haven't talked about a lot. Um, so I'm curious about what kind of support KM wants to provide there um, and, and how they think it will add value. So if you have thoughts on that, please put them in the chat because I would love to hear them. So when we asked about the specific benefits that KM could provide in those business areas where people saw untapped potential, again, we get a lot of different answers. Um, the most common answers focused on efficiency gains. So time saved looking for information and um, you know, also recreating information when you can't find it. We also saw those workforce demographic factors at play. So people thought that they could help with improving time to competency and also reducing those risks of knowledge loss as people near retirement or, or maybe are planning to leave the organization. And I think that those two are really important, but I will say they are also really hard to measure. I've um, worked with a couple of KM programs recently who wanted to improve time to competency, but they realized that the organization just didn't really know, everybody talks about it, but they didn't have any way to know what time to competency was now or what that even meant, and it wasn't very consistent across groups. 
And the same is true with a lot of these knowledge loss risks. They're incredibly important to deal with and manage, but they're not always easy to quantify and, and put on a scorecard. So not at all telling you not to do it, but just something to be aware of as you think about you know, your, your portfolio of KPIs. And then there are some speed and agility benefits, obviously, um, in terms of faster cycle times and problem resolution. And that's a trend that I think we've seen um, over the last few years, KM backing away a little bit from helping the business save money and more towards helping the organization be faster and more agile. Uh, and then finally, improving quality and, and, and increasing innovation. So I think the opportunities are going to be, um, you know, obviously different and the benefits from organization to organization. But this focus on efficiency and agility really resonates right now. And, and it's a great play for KM in, in terms of delivering value. So we did some analysis comparing the areas where KM respondents, um, you know, see uncapped potential to add value and the activities that their KM teams perform. And I don't want to read too much into this, and I'm also going to apologize for my DIY data visualization here. I don't have a great tool to map this, so I did it on my own. Um, but there are a few interesting patterns that I want to point out here. So <clears throat> first of all, people see innovation uh, people who see innovation as a high potential area, um, they're really pursuing a pretty broad KM portfolio where they're statistically more likely to do knowledge mapping, uh, lessons learned, capture transfer of expert knowledge and expertise location. So my takeaway here is that innovation can benefit from a mix of KM approaches that, that help identify that critical knowledge and opportunities help people find co-collaborators for innovation, and also document knowledge from people and projects. So the, the next thing that I see here is all of the arrows that are pointing to after action reviews and lessons learned. Um, you know, and, and my takeaway here is that lessons learned have broad appeal um, and the upside to help a lot of different groups, which I think makes sense because a lot of or, you know, a lot of different business groups can benefit from looking at what went well and what went wrong and, and what they could do next time, um, you know, or, or share with teams that, that are doing similar work. So I, I think that that has a lot of broad appeal, um, no matter where you see opportunities. And then the final thing that stands out to me here is that KM teams that see untapped potential for corporate strategy and innovation are more likely to have processes in place to capture and transfer expert knowledge. And I think organizations over the last few years are recognizing that they have this brain drain in some of their really important engines. So their senior leaders and the people who are, you know, making innovation within the organization, figuring out where the organization is going to head, breakthrough ideas. And in particular, if senior leaders are worried about their legacy and retaining critical knowledge that they have, and KM can get in there and help with that, that's an opportunity to really build some buy-in with people who make the budgets and sign the checks. Um, you know, so however idealistic we want to be, impressing those folks is important, and, and I think that that represents a real opportunity here. So we also asked about the biggest barriers that KM teams see preventing KM uh, implementation and adoption in those uh, areas where they see untapped potential. And the number one barrier by far is lack of resources or time available for KM. Almost two thirds of respondents list that in their top three. And then the other barriers are around, you know, lack of resources and funding within KM itself and then leaders and, and end users who are either not aware of KM or skeptical about the value that it can provide. And I think all of those get linked together a, a little bit. If leaders and staffs don't see the value, then uh, you know, they're skeptical, they, they, they don't see um, what this can do for them, then they're not going to allocate time and resources. And, and if KM is constrained in terms of resources, then there's really no one to help with a lot of that heavy lifting. 
So I just says sounds like a typical job on, uh, day on the job. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't think that there's anything that's really new here. Um, and, and I have these cute kind of fix it tips on the slide. I, I recognize these are complicated problems that are supremely difficult to overcome. Um, but I, I do think there are a couple of actions that KM teams can take to kind of inch forward through some of this. Um, first of all, if you don't already, um, you know, have a clear elevator speech for what KM can do specifically for each function and business area. Um, you know, and, and if you see opportunities to articulate those clearly in the language and the context that is going to make sense to that particular business group. And, and you may need separate pitches for the leaders and the end users if, if there's different value to be provided from each context. And then the second one is really to be honest about what you need from the business and try to establish some clear roles and responsibilities. And I know this is easier said than done, but I think if you can't get those commitments, you may need to direct your limited resources elsewhere. A uh, longtime KM leader that we've worked a lot with said, you know, that he doesn't go after bad business. Um, you know, so if a business group won't agree to what's needed to make that project successful, you, you just kind of politely decline and reorient towards projects that you think have a, a greater chance of success because they're getting resourced appropriately. It, it's not always possible, but I do think it's good advice when you can apply it. And then if you're getting a lot of KM interest across the business that, that exceeds the resources that you have, um, you know, I think you've got to go back and, and make a pitch to see if you can get some more resources or find a different way to fund the work, um, you know, maybe with bigger allocations from those business units that want the help, um, you know, and just look for creative ways to streamline and scale what you're doing. So I want to move on to this final section. Um, I, I know how to is important. Um, you know, I want to tease out some of the success drivers that we see. Um, you know, when we look at KM programs that effectively partner with their business stakeholders and have managed to get knowledge moving across the business as a whole, what sets them apart? And I think we've got a poll next. And this is actually a question that we asked on the survey. Um, we asked respondents, uh, you know, this exact question. So how effective is KM at optimizing the movement of knowledge across your end-to-end -end business processes on this five-point scale from very effective to not at all effective? Um, so I thought it'd be fun to calibrate uh, for, for y'all on the call, um, you know, against the people who took the survey. And then for the rest of this section, we're gonna look at people who rated um, this question as effective or very effective, with people who run, rated it uh, somewhat slightly and not at all effective, and, and see if there are any meaningful statistical differences between those groups in terms of the areas of the business they support, the you know, drivers and barriers that they see, the tools and approaches that they're using, and, and see if that gives us a few hints um, for maybe some things that some of us could, could do differently or, or move in a slightly different direction. So hopefully you all have mostly voted. Uh, I will tell you that for the survey respondents that we had, we had about equal groups, 35% um, in that effective, very effective category, 10% in the very effective, 25 in the effective, um, and then another 35% in that somewhat effective group, and then 30% in that slightly and not at all effective group. So it was very evenly distributed between, uh, you know, uh, effective and, and less effective. Um, and, and then we also asked a question about the effectiveness of, of business partnering, and that was about 45% in that effective and very effective category, whereas 55% a little lower. So I think we should, y'all have had enough time to, to vote, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and look at the results. So that doesn't surprise me, a lot of you in that somewhat effective category, but it, it's nice, um, you know, um, not that many in the effective and very effective categories. So for 
23 percent of you then this may make a lot of sense in terms of things you're already doing but for the remainder of you that are in that not at all slightly and somewhat effective group hopefully there'll be some ideas of, of drivers that, that you can use moving forward as we go through the last section So some of the biggest differences that we saw between those that were effective or less than effective at optimizing the flow of knowledge across these end-to-end -end business processes, uh, both on the business partnering side and the, uh, those optimizing, um, is around centralization and standardization. So respondents who said their organizations have some kind of enterprise-level KM program, significantly more effective on both fronts. And then also those who said that KM was mostly centralized or hybrid, significantly more effective than those who were more on the decentralized side in terms of program structure. And I think this makes a lot of logical sense, right? Um, if KM has some centralized aspects and is able to look across the enterprise versus just one function or business unit, it's going to be better positioned to help groups share knowledge with other groups. Um, you know, and different KM efforts are also more likely to use standardized methods and tools. So people are putting their knowledge in the same place, using the same methodology to capture that and, and tag it to a taxonomy, for example. It's much more likely to be effectively used across the business. Um, you know, and, and interestingly, those centralized and hybrid groups, I, I don't have the data up here, also more effective at business partnering. And I, I thought these more niche specialized groups might actually be really close to the ground with their business stakeholders and able to partner really effectively, um, but that's not what we saw. We saw the opposite. Um, you know, and, and obviously, enterprise level KM, centralized KM is not the right approach for every organization, especially if the organization itself is very decentralized. Um, and, and as a KM leader within a particular functional group, you may not have a lot of control over this. Um, but, but I do think it's worth advocating for more standardization, even if that's just getting different more local KM groups together and, and deciding on some things you're going to do uh, in a consistent way. Um, you know, if there's any opportunities to partner with different groups that are doing KM officially or unofficially, um, you know, I think that really helps. And even if you can get two or three business groups banded together to say, hey, we're going to centralize some of this work, um, you know, then that can create a little bit of a snowball effect where you bring new or new groups kind of say, oh, I saw those groups are doing it this way and getting really good value. I might want to get on board. So sometimes you can incrementally move towards a, a more centralized or enterprise solution. So in line with that, KM teams that effectively optimize the flow of knowledge across the business, um, they support more functions in business areas overall, so 9.2 versus 6.5 on average. And they're also more likely to support enterprise functions like innovation, process management, quality, HR, learning, IT. Um, and again, I do think there's a little bit of a snowball effect here, uh, where if you can get groups like IT and HR that support the whole business on board with KM, it's a little bit easier to get their customer groups on board. Um, so if you have to choose and hate, make some hard choices about new parts of the business to engage, I, I think it actually makes sense to start with some of these enterprise spanning groups, since they tend to be broad influencers within the organization. So earlier, we, we looked at those reasons why KMers uh, you know, decide how much KM support to provide to a particular area. Um, and, and when we analyzed those, what we found is that when KM uses alignment with the organization's business strategy and goals as the main drivers for who's going to get high support and who's going to get moderate and low support, they tend to be more effective at both the business partnering aspect and optimizing that movement of knowledge across end-to-end -end business processes. 
So there's a lot of shiny objects out there, and I think it's really easy for KM to get pulled into projects because there's a really enthusiastic leader, or the team is going through a big IT transition and they need a lot of help. And it's not wrong to pursue those opportunities, but I do think it's easy for the KM strategy to get lost a little bit when the team is just running around and, and helping whoever screams the loudest. So you wanna be responsive to the business, but you can't just be a firefighter. You need to have a knowledge strategy that's aligned to the broader business strategy. And you need to make decisions based on that strategy about what's in and out of scope for your KM program, at least as much as possible. So we also saw organizations that were effective at, at moving knowledge across the business were a lot more likely to use seven specific CAM tools and approaches out of the 15 or so that we asked about. So first of all, knowledge mapping. If you haven't mapped your critical knowledge, please go do that, um, you know, especially if you're interested in getting knowledge out of silos. Those maps are going to show you where your knowledge currently flows across business processes, where the gaps and bottlenecks and, and problems are, and they'll allow you to get really targeted in facilitating knowledge handoffs between different groups who kind of pick up and drop off pass batons on, on different parts of those processes. Capture and transfer of expert knowledge and expertise location. I think one thing that we're recognizing is that as all of our work gets more complicated, um, there, there's different parts of the organization working on very different types of projects that still need similar expertise, you know, especially in things like core technology capabilities. So it's really valuable to allow people to find experts and, and access their expertise, even if they're in a different business area. Transfer of best practices and lessons learned. I, I think it's intuitive that identifying good things we want to replicate and bad things we want to avoid across the organization and, and making sure that knowledge gets out to people who can benefit from it, it is going to help us here. And then finally, content management and search. And that's like the last mile. You can document and share all of this stuff, but if, if you don't have a good content management and search solution, um, you know, that then people are not going to be able to find that fast and, and easy when they need it. And it's just not going to get accessed and applied in the way that you would hope. So we also looked at barriers to implementation and adoption that are most associated with lower effectiveness uh, for business partnering and, and optimizing these end-to-end -end knowledge flows. And I don't think it's going to surprise anybody that um, leaders who are unaware and skeptical of KM associated with lower levels of effectiveness in, in both spaces. Um, you know, it, it's not easy. Obviously, whatever you can do to get leaders on board that's gonna be a critical success factor for scaling KM. But I wanted to point out uh, these two sort of broader aspects of organizational culture that appear to be a drag on effectiveness. Uh, you know, if staff see knowledge hoarding as job security, then it makes it harder to partner with business groups and, and address their knowledge related challenges and problems. And if the culture values uh, individual achievement over collaboration, uh, then you're going to struggle to optimize the movement of knowledge across those business processes. And again, these are not easy problems to solve, um, but if you have opportunities to work with HR and your business leadership, um, you know, I think it's worth looking at how employees are measured and incentivized to see if you can make knowledge sharing and collaboration more explicitly rewarded within the culture. Uh, I, I think a lot of organizations have a lot of lip service to, we want people to share knowledge, we want people to collaborate, but then when you look at the things that individual workers are measured on, it's all these individual measures that, that pit uh, people and, and teams and business units against each other. So taking a step back to understand the message the organization's sending and if there's anything you can do to influence changes there, um, I, I think that can help you with some of these big picture goals of, of getting knowledge to flow across the business and, and getting these processes to work a little better. And then finally, so this is my last slide, so if you all have questions, please start putting them in chat. 
Um, we, we also looked at factors that are driving higher CAM demand within the business in the last three years uh, to see if any of those correlated with higher or lower effectiveness for, for optimizing that flow of knowledge. Um, and, and a couple of interesting things popped up that I wanted to end on. So first, organizations that selected automation and AI adoption as a major driver of increased KM demand, more likely to be effective here. And that may just indicate the overall maturity of their KM and digital landscape. Um, but I do see the movement towards automation and AI to be an opportunity for KM to get involved in something that is high visibility, uh, high stakes, really important to the organization and can be a game changer for, for knowledge management's credibility and, and status within the organization. And then on the flip side, we see organizations that said remote and hybrid work was a main driver for increased KM demand, less likely to be effective in enabling those end-to-end -end knowledge flows. So again, many potential reasons here but I do worry about KM teams getting buttonholed as the, the virtual collaboration and digital workplace support team. Um, so many employees went remote in 2020 and, and KM teams did this great job of helping the organization triage that, um, helping them pivot to support remote work and learning. And there's certainly value for KM to be involved in that, but it shouldn't be 80, 90% of the KM team's focus, in my opinion. And in particular, it may not be enough to get that knowledge out of those operational silos. So much virtual collaboration happens in the context of particular teams or departments. Um, you know, so there's more things you need to do to really elevate the relevant knowledge and get it to flow across the business rather than just, uh, you know, be well documented within that project team or within that, that group. Um, you know, and, and so I really want to make sure that KM teams don't lose sight of all the things that they can do to, uh, you know, make sure that collective knowledge is available to people and, and applied to those complex end-to-end -end business processes. So that is my last talking slide. Um, for those of you who are interested in digging into this research a little bit further, this first link here is Applying Knowledge Management in the Business Collection, and that's going to have all of the research that we talked about today. Um, a, a year or two, we also did a really good uh, project on knowledge management partnering and how KM can partner with some of these different groups, including you know, the business stakeholders, IT and digital, HR, learning, process management. So there's lots of great resources in there if you really focus on the business partnering aspect of this. And then I, um, I also included a couple of links here to some pieces focused on our excellence in knowledge management recipients and what we see in terms of how they partner with the business and really make sure that they're um, you know, addressing those unique needs while still supporting standardization and inconsistency um, you know, across these knowledge flows, because I think there's a real balance. All right, well, I think we've got a couple of questions. Um, Brittany, yes. did you? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a question. As we prepare to be future ready for the Omni channel with our call center and website, we're entering a period of time when mapping is important and we will have the same content on two channels. How do I answer folks who may be concerned about duplication and the value of being future ready? Is this the path I am temporary duplication considered a uh, best practice? I don't, I don't know if I have best practices on that specific situation, um, but, but I think that it makes sense to, if you're testing out a new environment, um, you know, and people are worried about the duplication, as long as you're actively managing both uh, both platforms, I think you're all right to duplicate with the understanding that you're moving towards this new new vision of omnichannel. Um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I think the only pieces you need to make sure is you're not just focused on the new one, but you're keeping the you know the the old uh, you know version up, um, you know, and not managing that effectively. You know, I, I think that that's um, 
that that's the biggest piece here is if you you are creating more work for yourself <laughs> and for the business in the short term so having a really clear reason that's communicated for why you're doing that um, you know and, and making sure there are resources to devote it to uh, to managing it effectively is, is the best thing you can do there and I saw there is a quick question on how you access the links um, we will send out a copy of the recording and slides from today's call. Um, you can access the links from there. We'll probably put the research collection link directly in the follow-up email as well. So you'll have access to all of this. All right, well, I don't see any more questions. Do you, Brittany? No, not currently. All right, great. Well, thank you all so much for joining today. I really appreciate it. And please connect with us. And I hope to see you at the next webinar.